Viewer discretion is advised. Our story takes place in the 90s in the Carolinas. Mm, beautiful. Um, on May 13th, 1998, the body of a woman was found like discarded on the side of like a frontage road that le- mm. ran alongside Interstate 85 in Spartanburg, South Carolina. The woman was Asian. She was in her early to mid 40s and she was clearly a victim of homicide. Her wrists and ankles had been bound, though the bindings had either been removed or simply, like, broken away. Um, But ligature marks remained, and that's how they could determine that. And an autopsy determined that her cause of death was suffocation, Mm. um, possibly by strangulation. But they knew that, like, they could even if they couldn't tell if it was strangulation or, like, another means of suffocation, she couldn't breathe. And that's how she died. Okay. So composite sketches of her were released, but she didn't match anybody in any missing persons database that would be like in that time frame with her time of death. Uh, And nobody called in with information about her and the case just went cold. Mm. Five months later and 200 miles away under a billboard along the same interstate 85 in Mabane, North Carolina. So we were in South Carolina. Now we're in North Carolina. Mabane. A landscaping crew was hard at work cutting the grass around and beneath a big billboard that was, like, right off the highway. Um, In an absolute shock to the crew, the remains of a young boy were found in the tall grass. The remains were badly decomposed. Like, there was one article where one of the guys on the crew said they only that he only noticed it because, like, the sun reflected off of the skull. Oh, wow. Of this this of is, like, this just actual, the skull. Yeah. Oh, like, wow. Like, the exposed, kind of sun-dried skull of this child. He was child. there for a while. Yeah, I mean, yeah. <clears throat> the, grass was, so, the grass was tall. Yeah, they were there yeah. to cut the grass down. Wow. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so the child had been, <clears throat> excuse me, this is September, so the child had been deceased, they figured, for, like, the better part of... Maybe not the year, but like at least a couple months. Yeah. So through the through um, the summer. Yep. And that's yeah. the thing. Like the North Carolina sun had sped up decomposition. So it was like he could have passed away or been killed two months ago or like seven or eight months ago. And it would kind of be the same mm-hmm. spot that we're in now because of that direct sunlight. Yeah. Um, this detail is like not one that I'm including just to be macabre, but to like establish the challenge that investigators had in front of them because it's 1998 and they need to identify this boy. Yeah. So this is from Wikipedia quote, the child was wearing khaki shorts, white socks and matching underwear and black and white shoes that appear to have been purchased recently. Mm. His shorts pocket was found to contain $50. The child had straight, dark brown hair, about three to four inches in length, likely had a light brown to fair complexion, and likely had brown eyes. The boy was initially thought to have been Hispanic and possibly a migrant worker or the child of a migrant worker. The boy had no fillings in his teeth, but he did have preventative dental sealing in multiple teeth, as well as a slight overbite with erupting upper canines, which I totally had as a kid. Uh, which may have been noticeable when he smiled or spoke. Mm. The boy likely died during the spring or summer of 1998. Excuse me. End quote. So autopsy results determined that the boy had been the victim of a homicide and that the cause of death was strangulation. As with the woman in South Carolina, sketches were circulated and they used the information they had to cross-check missing children's cases, but came up empty. Like, no missing child was a match for this kid. Well, they probably also have such a broad window, like you said, because of the they can't really tell how long the de- right. when the decomposition could have happened. So, so seven they're just to looking two at, months, you know. Right. They're looking at like a fuck ton of cases and they're not seeing anything that matches. That matches. That's wild. So that just indicates that it was not reported. Right. And not knowing that these two cases, like the case of the woman in South Carolina and the boy in North Carolina were at all related. It's different states, different investigators. There are no leads for either of them. And the boy's case went cold as well. Mm. The nameless boy would be referred to for years as the boy under the billboard, mm. which Aww. just broke my fucking heart. Yeah. So as in many missing persons cases or unidentified remains cases, the discovery of the child received much wider attention than the discovery of the woman months prior. 
not only were sketches of the child made, but estimations of like parents were sketched. Like this kid might look like this. And that means their parents might look like this. Like they were wow. trying fucking anything um, in the hopes of like sparking somebody's memory. The case was also taken on by the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children, who used their team of experts to create multiple reconstructions, which with the still kind of like in its infancy, but expanding CGI technology that was available in the late 90s, early 2000s. The remains were also tested using forensic palynology, uh, which is studying pollen and spores found on or even like in the lungs of a victim to oh, determine wow. places that they'd been prior to their death. It's like forensic botany. Yep. Um, they also use isotope analysis, which, as we know, puts cats in wigs, and that mm -hmm. tells you like where they may have been located for extended periods of time or where they had been born. Mm. Uh, so these forensic analyses suggested that the child was originally from the United States, specifically Alabama or Georgia, and this gave investigators more of a targeted area to find leads, holding out how the hope that someone in these states would recognize the sketches or the CGI renderings, but still nothing. 20 years goes by, not oh, a single no. lead. Mm -hmm. Oh, God. 20 fucking years. So it's 2018 now. Technology had advanced considerably in that time. So in 2018, the case of the child was looked at more closely. Genetic testing provided some hitherto unknown details. Um, it wasn't like his DNA was uh, being matched against other people, but they were almost doing like an, a 23andMe ancestry mm. um, so that they can update their sketches of this child because they may have been sketching like a completely different, you know, Skin tone. So you're saying, you're saying they used it to try, try to find people that were re like related to him in some kind of way? Eventually, to... yes. But initially, it was just to figure out like what is this boy's heritage essentially? Got it. Yeah. So they could like, so, like hair see color if... and, and things like that. Yep. Okay. Got, okay. Or exactly. Like, you know, maybe they're of Asian descent or exactly. Hispanic or whatever. Got it. Got it. So they had originally thought that the little boy was Hispanic, but this was not the case, and they found this out in the Ancestry DNA, that he was a biracial child of European and East Asian parentage. Oh, wow. So further examination of the remains under a more technologically advanced lens determined the time of death uh, to be during June or July of 1998. So that meant the boy had been laying unnoticed under the billboard for like the just summer. over two months. Yeah, just oh. hot, so in the hot summer. summer. Wow. Yep. Yikes. Around the time they released more information on this case, another famous case uh, was cracked that gave investigators an idea. That case, of course, is the Golden State Killer case, mm. which used familial DNA to identify that fucking rat, Joseph D'Angelo. Yes. Mm -hmm. So investigators took this opportunity to run the boy under the billboard through their DNA database and pray that some family member had submitted their results to like the GEDmatch database. So Barbara Ray Venter, who is a forensic scientist who was essential in the DNA identification of Joseph D'Angelo, took on this little boy's case. She was able to track down a familial DNA match to a first cousin, a young woman named Natalie Mosteller. Natalie had spent the last 20 years trying to reconnect with the cousin that she had grown up with. She was the oldest of three girls, and Natalie had grown up in Ohio near where her cousin lived, and the two had become like siblings. So she her considered cousin meaning the boy. Yep. Mm. The, the one who matched the DNA. And she hadn't seen him in over 20 years. Oh. Yep. She considered him the little brother that she never had. Oh. She recalls that when her aunt and uncle, her little cousin's parents, encouraged or encountered problems in their marriage, her aunt had decided to divorce him and return to her home of South Korea with her son. Or so the family had been told. Oh. Family secrets. Yep. Oh, family secrets. So Natalie had been all over Facebook and other social media entering her cousin's name in the hopes that they could reconnect, thinking that he had just moved to South Korea with his oh. mom. And that's why they hadn't seen him. So she even went as far as to hire a private investigator. She said, quote, it was nagging in the back of my head once Bobby, that was her um, cousin's name, and we'll get to all of the names, would have come of age that he didn't try to reach out to us, she said. Any attempts that I made on Facebook to try and find him, they didn't come up with anything. Mm. End quote. But in her worst case scenario, like family in South Korea had maybe like 
turned him and her aunt against the family in America yeah. because of what had gone down in the marriage. Mm-hmm. And so this, she was like, I just figured this was why I was never able to find him online. And she was completely unprepared for the truth behind their disappearance. Of course. So the little boy was identified as Robert or Bobby Witt, born in Michigan in January of 1988. Bobby was the son of Natalie's uncle, a Caucasian male named John Russell Witt, and his wife, a Korean woman named Myung Hua Cho. Natalie recalled Bobby as a sweet boy who loved playing video games and air hockey. Quote, he had an air hockey table in his bedroom, she said. What? Fuck. Yeah, such a cool kid. That is a flex. Air hockey. I know. Air hockey table in his bedroom. That's that, nuts. That's like a two-car garage it. with an ice fridge. That's Hell beyond. Yeah. It's so good. An anti-gravity game in your yeah, room? In your room? Yeah, that's amazing. <laughs> Alvin's mind just exploded. He probably had a gumball machine, too. Oh, What's man. next? Ugh, he, this kid deserved all the gumballs, whatever yeah. he wanted. Um, so Natalie's mother, Barbara, also had loving memories of time with her nephew, Bobby. She said, Bobby was a very brilliant little boy, and he was funny. He had a real dry sense of humor. Myung was also funny and fun. Literally, I'm going to have to say, probably the hardest working person that I've ever known in my life. Hmm. So they really loved like Myung and Bobby. Yeah. They, the family very much got along. There were no issues. I right. love a funny kid. I know. Mm-hmm. So, I love you know, hockey. Natalie and Barbara were extremely sad when in 1998, the Wits moved back to North Carolina. They were all living together in, uh, in Ohio she was seeing that they were over at each other's houses all the time. Now the family's moving away. They're devastated. Myung and John had originally met while John was in the Air Force and serving in South Korea. And they wed after a short time, possibly because Myung had become pregnant with Bobby. Mm. Uh, but I can't confirm that. Sure. And she moved with him to the, to the United States to get married and raise their child together. First, they were living in Ohio near their family. Then they returned to North Carolina. But about 10 years into their marriage, John started having an affair. Uh. Rather than fucking getting divorced. Yes. Which is just, arguably just, the best option. Just do yeah. that. Mm-hmm. Just do that. Just do that. He decided to eliminate his wife entirely so that he could get on with his new life. Jesus fucking I'm never under. It's crazy how often this is the way that a lot of these stories play out. And they're like, yep. well, I have, I'm having an affair. And if I could kill my family, current my current yep. family, then that'll make space for my new plans. It's like, right. Just It'll be get, easier just for me. Get divorced. Well, man. and he started out just just killing her. And then his mistress moved into his house shortly after he killed my young. But allegedly, the mistress didn't get along with little Bobby. Jesus. So one night in July of 1998, John took Bobby for a drive. This is his own son. His own son. Jesus. According to court records, quote, he requested that Bobby get in the back seat and told him they were going to play a game. He told him to lie down with his eyes closed. At that time, he crawled into the back seat, got on top of Bobby, and suffocated him with a towel. Oh, my God. That's probably exactly what he did. Well, not exactly. It's some, like, Chris Watts fucking shit. Big time. Big it's time. bizarre Literal that, like, family there's annihilator. so much time between these two, because yeah. that's not usually the case. Yeah, like five months or like something. tried to wow. live a new life with, his, with yep. his new girlfriend and the kid. Yep. And Who was like 10. Yeah. Yep. So it was probably old. like, where the fuck is my mom? Mm-hmm. And the idea that you'd be like, a woman would come there or any person would come there and be like, this kid is uh, annoying. Yep. Can he yeah. go? Like, what? Well, can you like. And, and so like, that's exactly what happened. Like the mistress comes in. This kid's annoying. Let's get him out of here. So John told her. That he had taken Bobby oh, to the airport it. to put him on a plane and send him to South Korea to be reunited with his mom. Since wow. he wasn't getting along with his new flame, he was like, oh, I can handle this. I'll take him to the airport. His mom moved to South- back to South Korea with family. Oh, he told I'll her send that him there. Oh, yeah. He told oh. everyone in the family, everyone that she and had moved mis- to South she Korea. Abandoned her, she abandoned her Left son. Left her son. Yep. With them. Then all of a sudden... Bobby's gone. Oh, well, Bobby and Myung are now reunited in South Korea. They don't want anything to do with me or us. So 
they're gone. Wow. That is so, so nobody awful. filed a missing persons report for either of them. No, like the, it, they're in they another just, country now. Yeah, they're gone. they just took him at his word. God. Yep. And, and she was originally from South Korea, right? Yes. So it was like was that. It's believable that she has family she, like, there. Went like, home. A dual yeah. citizen in some kind of way. Exactly. And this is like ninety eight. You said right. So there's no Google. There's. It's just like nope. people would when if you said somebody moved to another country in nineteen ninety eight. It's like. Well, you either then, believe bon it voyage, or, you know. Yeah. You just, okay, bye. Yeah, You're wow. an impossibly far away now. Exactly. We don't have any communication. And this fucking guy didn't even get like a whole bunch of freedom after his heinous fucking murders because I'm burping. He landed himself in jail after multiple armed robbery attempts in 1999. What a fucking idiot. Like, so many of them. He, I think he had, like, robbed six banks and then, like, threatened violence with a deadly weapon on, like, two or three people. So he was sentenced to 20-plus years at a federal prison. So he, like, oh. killed, and they and they still have no idea that he is also a murderer. So he's in jail. Oh my God. They have no clue. So, like... At least this made tracking him down to add additional charges of murder very yeah, easy he because easy. he was already in jail when the t- 20 years after these crimes were committed, he was still sitting there. Easy to find. But listen, clearly so in, they, were, they, were living a, they were living a very high-end lifestyle. I mean, an yep. air hockey table in home. Mm-hmm. Yep. They were living above their means for sure. Mm-hmm. So actually, mm-hmm. now when I think about it that way, I'm not surprised that he was robbing banks. You know, Who knows what yeah. else they were doing? They probably had like 100%. a Slurpee machine. Things that people don't, they're not supposed to, you're not supposed to have in your home. Well, and Ma Young, as Barbara remembers her, is the most hardworking person she'd ever met. Maybe Ma Young mm, is, the is, wor- is the breadwinner. Maybe she's wow. working and now she's gone. Yeah. And he's, you know, mm-hmm. it's just he thought it's he could a do fucking it without mess. her. Yep. And he was I'll, so wrong. That's I'll, speculation, but maybe. Alternatively, if he was robbing banks to provide for the family previously, similar to Alvin's case, mm-hmm. he got away with it. Might as yep. well keep doing it. Yeah. Might as well. There yeah. are no repercussions. Well, and that might be why he killed these people too. It's like, well, well, he didn't start robbing. He didn't start robbing banks until after he had already murdered his wife and child. Do we know and that? Then he, yes, we do know that. Mm. And then he was out robbing banks because he went to jail like within the year of him killing his wife and child. He went to jail for this. Mm-hmm. So maybe he had started robbing banks before he killed them. But like either way, he was consistently robbing banks. After after she was it, gone. Yeah, after she was gone. As I'd a, also yeah. be willing to bet he was doing something to break Fucking the law probably. before that. Yeah. You don't just pop don't off just, with homicide yeah. of your wife and son. But I mean, this yeah. fucking guy's a gem. Yeah. So. As a man, I can attest before we move on. I can attest to the idea that a dude would be like, this girl's so annoying. I mean, I could do so much better without her. I mean, the bills just get paid on their own. Right? And everything runs fine here. Good. It'll just keep running that way when I get her out of my life. And then now, it, yeah. she's gone. And it's like, Guess why, I'm a is bank house, now. why is the house being foreclosed? Though? I don't understand. It's like, so I could understand. Where did all the magic money go? Yeah, it's like, <laughs> it's a lot of foresight. Uh-huh. So in 2020, John Witt pled guilty to two counts each of second degree murder and concealing a death. He was sentenced to 26 to 32 years for each murder to be served consecutively after he completes a stint in federal prison for robbery that won't wrap up until 2037. So he's oh, going to die in prison. Jesus. Okay, bye. Now, his family had been absolutely blindsided by the secret that he had been keeping. So, like, Barbara's his sister, and Natalie is his niece, and, like, they had a relationship. Yeah. Like, they were looking I don't think for they him. Had, they were yeah, they didn't have... Well, they didn't... God. Yeah, they didn't... And they didn't have much of a relationship after he went to prison for the armed robbery stuff, but like they were very close growing up. Yeah. They still have a hard time wrapping their heads around this as all of their memories of John and Bobby were also happy ones. Natalie described Bobby as John's quote, little sidekick and said the family thought the two were super close. She said, quote, my uncle did have a really close relationship with his son. We thought that was his little sidekick. They did everything together. All outward appearances. They seemed to be a normal family, a normal loving family. They seemed like everything was okay. There was nothing that would make us think that there was a problem. Ugh. So when he opened up about the issues in his marriage or like planted seeds about the issues in his marriage and said that my young and Bobby were going to Korea, they took him at his word yeah. and really had no way to follow up. Like you mentioned earlier, Alvin, Natalie says, quote, how were you supposed to find someone in South Korea in the late 1990s and early 2000s? Yeah. We had no reason not to believe him. 
So she believes after seeing her uncle brought to justice that he has no remorse for his crimes, although he claims otherwise. At his sentencing, he said he was haunted by these killings and that he still loved his wife and son. He also claimed that he had made an attempt on his own life in prison in 2001 because of his guilt. Um, but as far as I read, this wasn't corroborated. So who knows? But I'll finish this out with Natalie's words, who never gave up on finding her cousin. Quote, all that effort that we put forth to try and find them, it made it seem like it wasn't for nothing. Because frankly, if she hadn't put the pieces together with this investigator through the DNA. It never been solved. We, we may have never connected the mom even. Yeah. Like, there's so many missing pieces that the family was able to be like, yeah, that's my cousin. They've been missing since this time. Like, and and maybe she submitted her DNA for the genealogy stuff. I think she, I think she did in order to find them. Also. I think she did because they are their first cousins. They are blood related. Like obviously, that's how this case got solved. It's just I just think she's so fucking awesome, mm -hmm. and I really feel for her. Um, she says, "I'm glad that my family has closure. I'm glad that the entire investigative team that has worked on these cases for the last twenty years finally have some closure." I'm glad that my cousin and my aunt finally have a name and that they're going to that they're going to be reunited and brought home Not which the they boy were under the billboard. Yeah, they both were uh cremated and then the family was able to have like an actual funeral, burial, and, like really start their process, process of moving yeah. forward. Yeah. They thought they just lost touch with them. Yeah. Yep. And now they're dead and they've been dead. And they've been dead for 20 years. Wow. Yeah. Uh, she continues to say, I am thankful for everyone who has worked on this and who has made it possible for us to finally bring Bobby back home and give us some closure. Our hearts are broken into a million pieces. We had no idea that Bobby and my young were no longer with us and had not been for a very long time. Oh, my God. That's so sad. Isn't that fucking heartbreaking? Yeah. So, that's so fucking. Have you, either of you guys seen Lion? Yes. And Dev Patel's looking for Gadoo the whole movie. And then... Oh, I haven't seen it. Oh, then never mind. Don't worry about it. It's, oh, but I'll Amanda. I'll forget about it. Yeah. You know. Your heart. Uh, just rip it out. Just rip it uh, out. Just rip it out. You're not going to need it anymore. It's, oh my God. But uh, it's, you know, it's so interesting. Like we live in such a, we live in such a cool time in regards to this story where Chris Watts is such a good uh, example to bring up because when there's the family saying, oh, he was his little sidekick and stuff. But if you had home video mm -hmm. and you have like a behavioral analysis, watch that video. Like Chris Watts, Everybody's like, oh, he seemed like the perfect dad. And then you have somebody go back and watch footage you of him just see being the like, cracks. I don't yeah. know. I don't have, I don't know where the Christmas lights are. And you're like, this guy was miserable the whole time. Totally mm -hmm. disconnected. You know? mm -hmm. It's like, you know, it's like, so, you'd, you'd have to be to kill your own child. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So it's like, it's crazy how you just assume somebody's like, you're just like, they're a family. So of course he loves his kids. And right. I remember we spent, he dressed up like Santa Claus and we spent Christmas mm -hmm. together and stuff. But you don't, if you could go back and like watch that moment, like yeah. you can today because everybody everything's filmed. You literally never know what's happening behind closed doors. Exactly. You just don't mm -hmm. unless you have access to an indoor fucking camera, yes. which now do I need to set up cameras all over my house? Because <laughs> your brain will just like connect the dots. You'll be like, yes, it's uh, Easter. We yeah. hired an Easter bunny for the day. Like there's kids here. Of course, the parents are happy to see their Everyone's kids. Everyone's happy. Yes. Yeah. You look, go no. back and look. It's like, yes. So yeah, this guy probably never was never wanted this. You know, he probably always wanted out. Yes. It just reiterates what I always say now: just never meet a man. No. Yeah. No. It's, just, it's not worth it. Yeah. It's not worth no. it. Agreed. I agree. <laughs> as as someone engaged to a man, never it's meet risky. him. Never meet him. Never meet it's him. A, it's a risk. I'm really rolling the dice. I also, don't do like. It. Don't just get married because your partner falls pregnant. Right. But that's a great different, idea. You know, also, if you're times, considering homicide, get out of a relationship. Yes. Just leave. Just get a divorce. If you're just considering leave. homicide, please consider divorce. There just are leave. always better options. Just leave. Yep. Just leave. Well, I sure hope you liked that clip. If you did like that clip, make sure you are subscribing to our YouTube channel, leaving us a nice review, and joining us on Patreon for even more video content, audio content, salacious content all around. Come join us. Treat yourself.